What's going on guys? It's Nick here, back with another video. Today we'll be going over some wide receiver cornerback matchups as well as the biggest injury news that you guys need to pay attention to. These situations change very quickly though, so you can't just use a player's status as of the point that I'm recording this video and think that it's going to stay the same. It's not going to. Just like I said last time, the goal here is to make you aware of all the different situations around the league, and you need to be sure to check Saturday night and Sunday morning if I talk about one of your players and make sure that they either are still looking like they're going to be out or are actually going to play. Um, I will be posting a pinned comment to this video uh, if like big pieces of news change uh, from what I said. But the best thing you can do is follow both myself and Adam Scheffner on Twitter and make sure you put the uh, push notifications on for Scheffner. He's going to put a lot of stuff out on Saturday, on Sunday morning, and you just have to be available uh, to see that because you, know, you don't want to be starting a player that's not playing and just lose because of that. So we'll go over all that, but first we have to do the stat of the day. Yesterday's stat was that there were 13 wide receivers to post at least 100 receiving yards in week one. Given their total volume, I asked who had the fewest expected receiving yards, i.e. who got a little bit lucky to get that 100 yards. And the answer was Robert Woods, which was actually pretty surprising to see. And Curtis Harris was the first to get that one right. Today's stat, among all tight ends in week one, who was in on the most receiving snaps? All right, let's go over some injuries. And oh my goodness, there are a lot, but this is what we expected. With a limited camp, with no preseason, we were expecting a lot of groin, hamstring injuries, lower body injuries, uh, things that are more related to just not being uh, football ready to start the season. So it's unfortunate it's happening, but it's not exactly surprising. So first up, we have John Brown, and it was looking like he was going to miss this week due to foot injury. However, he practiced full on Thursday. So unless he gets a downgrade on Friday, then I'm just going to assume that Wednesday was more maintenance related uh, and just not worry too much about that absence. And if he's playing, then he's got a really nice matchup. So you're probably playing him. Uh, Miles Sanders has been practicing in full this week, which is very good news. Unless he suffers a setback, then he should be good to go this week. The Eagles get a home matchup with the Rams, which isn't you know an easy matchup. But I think you need to start Sanders if he's active. One thing I would want to try and see is will there be a snap count? So if we learn on Sunday morning that he's capped at like 20 or 30 snaps, well, then it becomes a much more difficult decision and you might have to bench him for another week. So definitely check my rankings on Sunday morning because I'm going to have that factored into the rankings. But just make sure you're on top of it in general. Check what Scheffner's saying, check what beat reporters are saying, uh, and just make sure you're not starting him if they're saying he's going to be out there for 20 snaps because he's you know, probably not going to hit value if that's the case. Le'Veon Bell was placed on the IR with a hamstring injury, meaning that he will miss at least the next three weeks. The Jets get a brutal matchup with the 49ers, and they have an extremely low team total. So honestly... I don't think you're starting like any Jets players. We're going to talk about Crowder, who's also out this week. Like if they don't have Bell, they don't have Crowder. They were already going to get crushed. This is already a brutal matchup. Now you have these fringe starters getting even more difficult matchups. The only person in this entire game, I guess two players. You could look to Herndon just being like, hey, maybe he gets like 12 targets in this one because they're going to be down. They're going to have to throw the ball. But Honestly, they might score 10 points, and so I just don't want anyone. But I guess the two you could look at are Herndon and maybe, maybe LaMichael P. Ryan if you're in like a 16-team league and you need to start someone. Because uh, he had a fantastic camp, and he has the skill set that we would want in fantasy, right? So he's the type of player who probably isn't going to get a ton of work on the ground, especially coming off an injury. And this is even assuming he plays because Pirine might not even play. But if he's out there, maybe he can be a little bit more involved in the receiving game uh, and that would boost his fantasy value. But in general, probably just Herndon's the only person you would even touch on the Jets entirely. Uh, Duke Johnson has been getting limited practices this week. I don't really think uh, his status really affects anything. You're starting David Johnson regardless. He's got a large enough workload that... I'm not going to say he's matchup proof, but you should probably just be starting him in any matchup. 
Uh, his floor and ceiling both increase if Duke is out. But again, I think you're starting him anyways. Uh, and then as for Duke, like even if he plays, this is a tough matchup against the Ravens. And coming off an injury, I just don't really see a scenario outside of about a 16-team full PPR league. I don't think you would start Duke. Um, what to do with James Conner is probably on everyone's mind. Uh, so Conner missed practice on Wednesday. Remember, they played on Monday night. So missing Wednesday isn't the end of the world, but it's not ideal. But then he returns to full practice on Thursday. So beginning of the week, we thought he's probably going to miss this week. You know, he left very early in the game. We see Snell take over, look really well, misses the practices. We're like, oh, Connor's going to be out. Well, now it looks like he's probably going to play. But his problem might be more Benny Snell than it is his own ankle. Snell drew great reviews in camp, and he looked really good in week one. Now, I personally do not own Connor in any leagues, so I can't give you an example of a decision that I'm choosing between, but I would probably try and find a replacement. Even if they said James Connor is going to play, and even if they come out and say he's still the starter, I don't trust it. I do not trust that they're going to look at what Benny Snell did because Benny Snell looked better than James Conner, even when Conner was playing. So he looks that good. I have a really difficult time believing they're going to completely bench him, right? And so if we have a situation where Snell is splitting the early down work with Conner and they're still using Jalen Samuels or maybe they activate uh, Anthony McFarlane and use him instead, but regardless, it's not like they're just going to give Conner the job back. And especially coming off an ankle injury, why would they just throw him in there to 100% of snaps? So I don't think you can start him. And I honestly think if people are sending you trade offers for James Conner, I think you take him. Because I brought up Anthony McFarland. He's not going to be a healthy scratch every week. So as they get McFarland going, he's going to turn into more of a change of pace guy. They like Benny Snell. He's going to be used. I don't see a situation anymore where Conner is just the guy. Even though they said to start the season he would be, I think he just lost the job. So... I'd be looking to move on from him, uh, and I would be willing to take a discount. This is the first player this season where um, you guys know I say you don't sell high in your studs, especially in the beginning of the season. But I don't see an outlook aside from like a Benny Snell injury to where we're trusting James Conner. And so if people want to trade you something for him, I think you got to take it. Phil Blunzey has a toe injury. Um, hasn't practiced all week, not looking like he's going to play. This would be incredible news for Melvin Gordon owners if they weren't playing the Steelers. You know, this is a team that held Saquon Barkley to 15 carries for six yards, right? And it's, it's, not, it's not a situation that even if we have Melvin Gordon, who I think is probably going to get, I think a good estimate would be like 65% of the work because they are still going to use Royce Freeman. But in pretty much any matchup, we have Melvin Gordon getting like 65% of the work. We're starting him, right? But this is the one team where I have a pause. So I have him ranked as a low end two. I think roughly in that like 18 to 24 range is where you're looking. So if you have three running backs that roughly rank inside the top 18, well, bench him because this is a brutal matchup. But if you drafted him as running back two and then you kind of waited a while, you went heavy on tight ends and wide receivers and quarterback and you don't really have a second option, I think we'll get enough work to where you're not just going to be uh, super disappointed with his production. You're probably not going to be pumped with it, but he's going to get goal line. He's going to get some receptions. And so with the worst case, he's going to get you some fantasy points. But again, I would prefer someone else. George Kittle has a hyperextended knee and he will not practice all week. As of recording this, he has not been declared out. I believe we're going to get that update on Saturday. I think either in that like Saturday morning updates or in those midnight updates. One of those two, I think we're going to have a solid indication of what his status is. If he's playing, you're playing him. He could destroy the Jets on one leg. I don't think he will, though. I think the 49ers are going to look at this and be like, we can crush the Jets. The Jets are terrible, and they're missing two of their like best skill players. If we lose without George Kittle, we deserve to lose, right? Like, they deserve to lose that game if they can't beat him without George Kittle. So, I think they're going to play it safe. They're going to hold him out this week. Uh, but again, if he plays, you probably have to play him. Uh, but as an owner, honestly, it's, it's really weird to say, but if you own George Kittle, you should hope that they hold him out. That they don't just throw him out there when he's got this injury and risk re-hurting it. Because also, if he plays... Technically, he could be a decoy. He could be playing like 10% of snaps. He could be active, but like 
not really going to get any snaps unless the game's close late. So if you own him, I think the best scenario for you is that they declare him out, they rest him, they get him good to go next week, and you just know going into the week you've got a better option. But hopefully we find that out on Saturday. Hopefully you guys know already watching this video, but I want to like let you know he, he might miss, he might play. I don't really know at this point. The biggest wide receiver news is probably Michael Thomas. He's going to miss likely the next two weeks, um, but definitely this week with his ankle injury. That means a ton of targets have just opened up on the Saints. Emmanuel Sanders will be flex viable this week for sure. And if you wanted to play him at the wide receiver too, you can. This is a solid matchup against the Raiders. They're not going to put up that much resistance. And it should be a relatively high scoring game. I would say a good line. I don't know what the line is right now. But in that like 48 to 52 range, I think it's a, a higher scoring game. Yes, the Saints have a good defense and they could limit the Raiders, which would lower the chance of a shootout. But if the Raiders get going, I mean, the Saints have enough skill players to where even if with Thomas out, they can still crush. So I think this is a good game environment. I think you're playing Sanders if you have him. You are absolutely starting Jared Cook as a mid-range tight end one if you have him. Traquan Smith is worth an add in deeper leagues, but if you're in a 10 or a 12 team league, honestly, you don't need to go there. You'll have better options. Um, I think the biggest impact is just the workload for Alvin Kamara, Emmanuel Sanders, Jared Cook. All those guys have a very secure workload this week, a very high ceiling, and I'd be starting all of them in this matchup. Uh, one huge bit of news that you're going to need to monitor is Chris Godwin. Now, he's in the concussion protocol as of recording this, but he just returned to practice. I got this update like right as I'm hitting record. Um, that likely means he's close to returning. He's close to passing the concussion protocol. It does not mean he passed it. So maybe you guys know already, but him returning to practice does not necessarily mean he passed the concussion protocol. He will need to pass that before he's able to play, but monitor this. You're watching this on Saturday, you're watching this on Sunday morning, just check, is he active this week? Because you know you can't play if you still have a concussion. Uh, but if he's active, you're starting him. This is a dream spot. Um, same thing with Mike Evans. I think if he's active, you're starting him. Uh, but he played last week. He was limited this week, kind of what we should expect. You know, They're not gonna throw him out there uh, in full practice when he's got this hamstring injury because he, at, he was at a huge risk of re-injuring it last week. I was very surprised he played. But he didn't. That's great news. He didn't hurt it as of recording this. Maybe he suffers a setback on Friday. Um, but right now, he's good to go. And so if he's active, you're absolutely playing him. Um, A.J. Brown is out this week against the Jaguars. That's brutal for the Titans. And then he might actually miss a few weeks after this week. And then also, Corey Davis has been limited uh, this week. It seems like Corey Davis is going to play. And if he does, then he's honestly viable in the flex as just like a volume play. You know, it's not like A.J. Brown is just a target hog. But when you remove A.J. Brown, Corey Davis is pretty clearly the best receiver. Um, Humphreys will get more work. John o. Smith will get more work. And then obviously, Derrick Henry is just locked in as like a top three running back. But... You could play Corey Davis in the flex uh, if he's active this week, and it looks like he's not going to be like super limited. Cortland Sutton might play this week. Um, you can start him if you're desperate, but I would prefer trying to find a better option. The Steelers, like I've been over in this video, are just a matchup that we're trying to avoid at every single position every week this year. They're an awesome defense, and I just don't want to start players against them especially when they're players who are coming off an injury and we can't be sure exactly how many snaps he's going to play. Uh, final two injuries are Kenny Galladay and Devontae Parker. Both could miss this week due to hamstring injuries. It seems like Galladay is very, very unlikely to play. But even if he's active, I don't think you can start him. Like if he is just a surprise active, there's no way they throw him out there for a ton of snaps. So just assume that he's out. I'm pretty sure he'll be declared up by the time you guys are watching this video. But if he plays, do not start him. Uh, kind of the same thing with Parker. Um, not that I think he's definitely not going to play, but that I don't think I trust him. This is a very, very difficult matchup that the Dolphins are in. And so if you also have a hamstring injury and you're going to be limited, it was kind of similar to Mike Evans last week. It was where we tanked him in the rankings because even if he was going to play, he's got a hamstring in a tough matchup. Like, he's not going to get open, and we saw that. He had, what, the one, like, six-yard touchdown catch? I actually don't remember how far the touchdown was, but he had, like, the one touchdown catch. Maybe we could see the same thing with Parker. He's very, very limited. He's got a brutal matchup, and so he's active, but you don't want to play him. 
So those are a ton of injuries, um, but make sure, again, you guys stay on top of things. Let's go over the wide receiver cornerback matchups. And since we just did a bunch of negative talking about all these injuries, let's do some positive. So we'll start off with some good matchups this week. And the first one up is Stephon Diggs at the Dolphins. Xavier Howard used to be a corner that we feared, but that has not been the case for about the last year. He was targeted on 20% of routes last week and allowed a 100% catch percentage. Diggs should go off this week. He is an elite wide receiver. He showed that he does have chemistry with Josh Allen. They showed last week that even when they're winning, they will air it out. Uh, and so I don't see a scenario unless you've got just incredible wide receivers, in which case you don't need to watch this video because you're going to win anyways. I'd be starting Diggs. Uh, Amari Cooper versus the Falcons is a dream spot. I believe he's got some sort of small injury, uh, so just pay attention to that. But basically, you could remove Cooper. You could just say C.D. Lamb versus the Falcons, Gallup versus the Falcons, Cooper versus the Falcons. It doesn't matter. Whoever is playing wide receiver versus this team, you want to start. Now, if Cooper is playing, I believe he's going to see a lot of A.J. Terrell, which is a great matchup because he allowed a perfect quarterback rating when targeted last week. And the Falcons as a whole, you know, they allowed Wilson to complete 31 of 35 passes for 322 yards and four touchdowns, including 13 passes of 15 or more yards. Dak is going to be able to do whatever he wants this week. There's going to be a ton of explosive plays, and that's going to benefit mostly Cooper and Gallup. But I would not be shocked if all three of them have a solid game, especially if the Falcons can put up points against the Cowboys. We could see this game, both teams get into the 30s, which would be epic. Um, I also think that you should be starting Sammy Watkins, and this is a fringe one. I'm not saying just force him in the lineup. Like if you've got you know three you know wide receiver one, wide receiver twos, you don't need to start Watkins. But if you need someone, you know he was targeted on 32% of routes last week, which was tied for the sixth most among wide receivers, and He'll be matched up with Casey Hayward this week, who allowed a target on 36% of his routes covered, which led the league. So remember what I said, we're not just like jamming him in over studs, but the Chiefs, you know, are a pretty good offense. And while they could still drop 40 and just not even need to use Watkins, they're going to move the ball a ton. And if he was targeted that much last week, going up against a corner who allowed a ton of targets, you know, this is a great matchup. And I think being on this offense as a starting wide receiver... I think using him in the flex is a solid move. Tough matchups, though. We'll end the video on that. Um, probably the toughest matchup of the week goes to DK Metcalf. Obviously, he's talented enough to just erupt in any matchup. So if you don't have better options, then you definitely can start him. Um, but he faces the trio of Gilmore, McCordy, and JC Jackson, which is one of, if not the best trios in the league. Um, the Pats may have lost a lot of pieces on their defense, but their corner and defensive back play remains very strong. Just for reference, in my money league, I have five wide receivers. We have two wide receiver spots, and then we have two flex spots, and I usually play four wide receivers. So I start four out of five every week, or I will be. It's only been one week. <laughs> so I will be starting Allen Robinson, DJ Moore, Robert Woods, and Marquise Brown all over Metcalf this week. So it's not like I'm benching him for like Alan Lazard. Like if you don't have good options, then start him, right? He's still a physical freak. He could still catch two 60-yard touchdowns and just completely go off. But on average, this is a very difficult matchup. And I would prefer if you had wide receivers who have better matchups. So I'm cool keeping on the bench if you have to. Um, next up, we have basically all the Jets wide receivers. I kind of already went over this, I guess. But just to reiterate. I don't care if you are in like a, I guess if you're in a 16 or 18 team league, uh, but the mo majority of you guys are in 10 and 12 team leagues. Just avoid it. It's a situation where they're going to score like 10 to 14 points. So you're just praying that you pick the guy who scores a touchdown. But would it shock any of us if they score six points? No. So just completely avoid the Jets. It's a brutal matchup against the 49ers. We're just going to steamroll them. The last matchup we'll go over is Preston Williams. And I actually think this one is important to go over. Um, I think that a lot of people are going to look to him if Parker ends up being out, but I think that'd be a mistake. Again, this isn't basketball, okay? In basketball, when you see a stud go out, all this usage, all this assists and these rebounds, they go to the remaining players and the total might drop a little bit, but so much usage just left the field or left the court, I guess, that you can start all these backups and they're great values. 
That's not exactly the same thing in football. It is a little bit for running backs when you have a backup come in and you know they're still going to get like 15 carries and a few receptions. But all it's going to mean for Preston Williams if Parker is out this week is that now he has to go up against Tredavious White and Levi Wallace on every single snap. And when you're the Bills and you look at this offense and you're like, oh, the only talented wide receiver they have is Preston Williams. So we can just completely scheme him away and say, okay, beat us with Isaiah Ford, Jakeem Grant, and your four mediocre running backs, right? Try and do that, okay? You're not going to be able to, and so they'll just take Preston Williams away. So you almost want Parker to play this week. Again, this isn't every week. When they're playing a terrible defense, sure, if Parker's out, Williams is going to get peppered with targets. But even if he gets peppered with targets this week, they're not going to be efficient. Their scoring chances are going to be low. And so I guess he could score like 5 for 40, but it's just not a situation you want. So keep Preston Williams on free agency for this week, and then he's probably not going to go off. And so add him going forward because this is a very difficult matchup. So those are injury situations to watch as well as some wide receiver and cornerback matchups I've been looking at. If you want to see my take on all players this week, then you can check out my rankings at our website, thefantasyfootballadvice.com. But that's the end of this one. Hope you all did enjoy. If you did, how about hitting that like button and how about subscribing to the channel if you're new. Thanks for watching.